When I returned to the club, it was already well into first period, and I really didn't expect to be doing much in the way of class. My phone chimed suddenly, and I pulled it out, thinking it was another text from Mom. The boy that never texts. I'm going home. I don't feel well. So, you're leaving me here again? He told you this time. Don't get all huffy. I'll come pick you up. Just call me when school is out. I might be asleep. Yeah, right. Fine. I flopped face first onto the sofa with a loud groan. Uh, worst morning ever. <laughs> I mean, I think we've had worse. I held up the little vial of gold liquid sloshing it around. Was this really going to help me? Brenna wouldn't have tricked me. Right? No. Right? I didn't think so. Right? Fairies did what they could to trick you, but they tended to keep their promises. Hmm, I don't know. This was for real. I just had to wait until midnight. I rolled to my back and stared up at the ceiling. Once I got this changeling thing sorted out, I needed to talk to Corvin. A long, long talk. There were so many things I needed to ask. I just hoped that he finally caught Kara Zorai. I really hoped he was going to be okay. Spencer came to pick me up, like promised, and I went straight upstairs when I got home. Has our brother been replaced recently? Mom texted that Grandpa's condition was the same and they wouldn't be coming home, which was to be expected. I kicked my shoes off and flopped onto my bed. Who is taking care of the business right now if both Grandpa and Dad are away? I really needed to write down what had happened during the day. I stood and went to my desk, pausing when I saw the small bottle of foxglove and bluebells sitting on the corner. Wait. Had I left the jars in that position? It felt like they'd been moved. I stood up, looking around my room. Nothing else seemed out of place, but... I pulled open the drawer, inspecting the contents. My journal was there, placed haphazardly on top of my pens and pencils. I frowned. Usually I set it in and put my pen on top of it. I shook my head. No, I was probably just being paranoid, and I didn't want to start sinking to Spencer's depths. Either that or the brownie had been playing around in my stuff. That wouldn't be a shocking bit of behavior. The last few days were a blur. It's the weather. I have a head cold. I probably just hadn't been as careful with my things. My phone chimed, and I picked it up to check. It was Corvin. I heard you talk to Bruno. I heard you did too. <laughs> You have enough on your own plate. Focus on your own problems. As I was waiting on a response to that, a text from Allie popped up. Hey, sorry I had to bail today. Did you get home okay? Yeah, no worries there. Everything else okay? You hinted that something... happened. Something, indeed. That was the understatement of the year. Yeah. I didn't have a chance to talk to you about it. There were... developments. I can't talk about it. Apparently those are the rules. Rules? Sorry, Brenna's orders. That worries me. I know. Me too. Cora is also worried about you. Did you know he has some kind of miasma infection? I don't know where you heard about that, but yes, I knew. I'm sure Corbin will tell you about it when he's ready. He seems to like to keep me in the dark about things, actually. I set my phone down and didn't pick it up when it chimed again. Clutching my journal, I flopped on my bed, trying to sort through all these mixed-up feelings. <sighs> I dragged my hands through my hair as I flopped back and groaned. Uh, everything was a mess. Hey, I ordered pizza. He had poked his head in the door before I could actually answer him, but I let it slide. He came delivering news of pizza, after all. Thank God. 
I am not up for cooking. Half pepperoni, half cheese? Yeah. Glad you remembered. I guess birthday pizza will have to suffice for now. Can we agree on no school tomorrow? I won't tell if you won't. He gave me a hesitant smile. Deal. Whoa. What? He smiled. Spencer smiled at me. I stared at him wide-eyed. Are... you okay? Spencer let out a dry laugh. Oh my goodness. Me, both me and Nora are like, are you well? <laughs> what do you think? I think you're probably as okay as I am. Spencer shuffled his feet awkwardly. Will you... come downstairs to eat? I want to talk. Okay, awesome. I am so happy. Yes. Smash all the yes I will buttons. I straightened immediately a little suspicious. He wanted to talk to me? That was definitely weird. I didn't know if I should be worried or not. If you want. He nodded and went downstairs to wait for the delivery guy. I was left alone in my room wondering what the heck was happening. Was this a good sign? Or was this going to be another fight? Or just more accusations about the club? Oh man, this was going to be interesting. Understatement of the century. Chapter 9, Dreams That Go Astray. It was awkward, now that we were both sitting at the table, a half-eaten pizza between us, it seemed like there was a decided lack of conversation. Despite what Spencer had said about wanting to talk, he wasn't saying much. Um, yeah? Spencer looked away, his fingers fiddling with the edge of his plate. <sighs> we were never going to get anywhere like this. Can you just say what you want to say, please? Okay. I read that journal in your room. Oh. Wait, what? Is what you wrote in there true? Wait. Wait. I thought you couldn't read that language anymore. You told me you couldn't read it. Spencer looked away. You lied? You jerk! I didn't want to deal with it back then. We just moved and... I don't know. I know you were trying to apologize. You ripped the note up and threw it in my face and said you couldn't read that stupid code anymore. Ugh. Whatever. Okay. Not getting mad about something that happened five years ago. I can't believe he lied to me. I can't believe you bought it. <laughs> And read my journal. I looked away, trying to not pout. And yes, it's all true. Exactly how much did you read? Well, most of it. I mean, I did forget some of the code, so... Some of the journal was a little confusing. Serves you right. I read... about the club. About... Everyone in it. Is that all really true? I mean, it sounds... But then... <sighs> Are you saying you read it and you're actually willing to believe it? Spencer chewed his lip. It's not like I haven't seen things I can't explain. I saw... On Halloween... In the woods... That was you! I hadn't had much time to think about it since then, but Danny and Elliot had tried to chase someone down. You evaded a werewolf and a vampire? This boy's the most magical of them all. I followed when you left. That was you the first night I left the house then, wasn't it? You followed me outside. That's why you were waiting in the kitchen when I got back inside. Knew it. And the night that thing chased me up to the house, you were planning to follow me. Something really chased you. Hang on, that's an entirely different situation. Back to the journal. It's all true. 
All of it. If you say you read it, then I'm not going to try to hide any of this anymore. But you should know it was supposed to stay a secret. The stuff about changelings. <sighs> I sighed. This time, because explaining all that mess was going to be... tricky. That's true as well. There was... some stuff about your soul that I didn't understand. Well, I barely get it myself. But I read enough to... to question if what I saw that time was really what I thought I was seeing. I started to wonder if the conclusions I came to were... maybe... not accurate. Well, I can't really address that without knowing what you saw and what you thought all this time. But I have to say, you're taking this better than I thought you would. That journal answered a lot of questions I've had for a long time. What exactly did you see five years ago? I saw you. I mean, not you. I saw... the white-haired one. Ah, her. When I separated from the search party, I found her in a clearing, all surrounded by lights. I didn't even know what I was looking at. Then they saw me and she just... changed. Right before my eyes. And suddenly it was you standing there. They chased me all the way back to the house, screaming at me to not look at them, pulling my hair. One of them touched my eye. And you lost the sight in it. I'm so sorry. I didn't... I mean, that wasn't... Me. I know. I knew it back then, too. I knew she wasn't you. Wasn't my sister. When I saw your journal entry about change leaves, I knew that had to be it. I thought about... About... Trying to make you leave. I mean, you know. Drowning you or something. I started having nightmares about it. <sighs> wow. It, that's... It's a big thing to admit to dr wanting to drown your own sister. I mean... You were hoping to get your sister back. But like, then you're like, crap, what if I'm wrong, though? And then I just killed my sister. Whew. Then I saw the recent entries. About souls. And I just... Decided not to try to kill me, I hope. It's not like I ever wanted to kill you. Just her. I didn't want to kill anyone! I just thought I'd do anything to get my sister back. But I decided... to talk to you first. I want you to explain it to me in a way I understand. Well, apparently... When fairies kidnap you, they don't just take your body. They switch your soul around because it's a convenient camouflage and makes you more useful for breeding stock. So... Your sister never left. I've been here the whole time. Just... with a bit of company. I still don't understand anything. I told you I barely understand it myself. But the main point is that I have a fairy in my head. Or rather, I'm in her head. And that's the way it's been for a really long time. So how do we get rid of her? Working on it. I was glad I hadn't written anything about the potion yet. I didn't know if that would count as telling someone, but knowing Brenna, it probably would have. What I'm still trying to figure out is... when this started. It had to have been a while ago. I started drawing that white-haired woman when I was really young. I've been thinking about that. Since we got back here, I've been having this dream. A dream I used to have a lot when we were kids, too. He was silent a moment, and I stood. Suddenly, I just couldn't sit still. I felt... jittery, anxious. I needed something to occupy my hands. Making some coffee. Want some? I think this may be a long conversation. He watched me as I went to fill the kettle. 
Do you remember that hill that was out behind the old house? That weird one that we used to play on in the woods? Yeah, we... I trailed off, getting the feeling of an old memory stirring around at the back of my mind. I dreamed that I went inside it. Something about that was... strangely familiar. There was a needle of pain behind my eyes as I tried to remember. Mm, that's a good sign. It was full of people. They... sang and danced and... I had fun. But when I wanted to leave, they wouldn't let me. And I went after you. You made a deal to save your brother, didn't you? I knew it, knew it, knew it, knew it! I murmured the words half to myself. The pain in my head increased, but I knew I was right. I looked at Spencer and said it again with more certainty. I went in after you, didn't I? He nodded. There was a flash of pain and it was like the veil lifted. Suddenly, I remembered it all. You got them to let me go, but... I had to agree to take your place. Our eyes met across the room and I knew that was it. That had to be the memory they sealed up, which meant... That was how the contract was started. Then this... All of it is my fault. No! That's... That's a pointless line of thought. I put the kettle down and went to him, sitting beside him. I took both his hands. He flinched, but didn't pull away. Listen to me. How old were we when that happened? Maybe seven? Talking about things like fault isn't going to help anything. If anyone is at fault, it's them. He swallowed hard and nodded. From there, we talked a lot about the various things that had happened to us as kids. Things leading up to the Hill Incident. The more we talked about it, the more details it came back to us. Whether it was the last of the memory seal crumbling away, I wasn't sure. I can't believe I forgot about that. You were missing for days. I had to sneak out to even get to the Hill. Mom and Dad never mention it. Do you think they forgot as well? It's possible they also had their memory sealed. It's also possible they don't bring it up because it seemed that we'd forgotten. They must think they're cursed. But with this... I was pretty sure I could safely break the contract with ben Brenna's potion. I remembered now. Besides, I'd agreed to become a changeling in exchange for them letting Spencer go. And I'd done that. I didn't recall agreeing to actually go live in Fairy. So technically, I fulfilled my end. Now all that was left was ending it all for good. All of this is so... strange. No matter how I look at it, things like fairy shouldn't exist. Welcome to my world. Do you even know what I've been through since we came back? I did read the journal. Yeah, well, I'm still slightly annoyed at that. How could they take advantage of two little kids? Even if their morals are different. Yeah, it's hard to wrap my head around, too. After that, Spencer wanted to know all the details about the club, the people in it, and everything else I'd learned about the paranormal. I'm just so worried that he's gonna get his memory wiped, though. And then all this progress we made is just... <sighs> Much of it was written in the journal, but I couldn't keep track of every detail. There was so much to cover. We talked well into the night. It wasn't until I looked at the clock and realized that it was close to midnight that I remembered I'd left my phone and the gold flask upstairs. Ewan wanted me to contact him before I drank it. There was a lull in the conversation and I told Spencer I needed to go to the bathroom. I couldn't tell him what was going on yet, but I could tell Ewan. Maybe have him come in and tell Spencer the full story after I drank the potion. He said he'd be staying nearby. I left Spencer in the kitchen and headed up to my room. I'd left a little flask of potion in my bedside table. Oh boy, I'm so I'm so nervous. <laughs> like, uh. I slipped the flask in my pocket and picked up my phone. I had a text from Ewan. Oh my gosh, 
that is your profile picture? Your eyes staring into my very soul? Stop. Nearly time. I know. Um, where are you? Still at home. Do I need to come? Would be good. Wait until I'm there. I will. Maybe I'll just wait until you showed up to tell him the Spencer knew everything. I stuck my phone in my pocket and was heading to the door when I heard the tap on my window. Dang. Ewan? Already? Then again, I was on the second floor. Curious, I went to check on it. You opened the window before... Never mind. Oh, you, you pulled the curtains back. Okay, you didn't open the window. I pulled the curtains back and screamed when I came face to face with a pale figure. It let out a hissing shriek when it saw me and slammed its face against the window. I scrambled backwards as it vanished. Kara's dream? It had followed me home again. I scurried to the opposite side of the room. Nora, what happened? I heard his footsteps on the stairs. No, don't come up here. There was silence. What do I do? What do I do? Where did it go? I hadn't gotten a great look at it. It had just been a blur of white. But it had seemed a lot bigger. But Barda, don't come up here. What's going on? Spencer, I told you to stay back! <laughs> the Ori slammed into the glass again. We both screamed and I showed him back into the hallway as wood splintered and gra glass cracked. Stay out there! I stared in horror as thin gold cracks appeared. Not in the glass, but in the air. That had to be Allie's ward. The cracks widened and first came a noise like shattering glass. Then the actual window shattered, sending a spray of glass inward. Barrier! Oh, it's a lot bigger! That's a, a, that's a, a big Kara-sized dream. That held it off for all of two seconds. I let out a scream and ran for the door. The Ori grabbed my ankle and I went sprawling face first. I expected to feel that same burning sensation from the last time it tried to possess me, but there was a loud crash and the sound of splintering wood instead. The Ori crumpled to a heap and lay still. Dang! Bro! Coming in clutch with the chair! Thanks, man. I stared up at Spencer in shock. He was standing over me, holding the last remnants of a broken chair. Isn't that Mom's Victorian rosewood chair from the hall? We'll worry about that later. She was going to be so pissed off. Don't just sit there! He grabbed me by the arm and pulled me to my feet, dragging me from my room. I managed to grab the knob and slam the door shut behind us. We scrambled down the stairs and I heard the door crash open. I don't think the chair slowed it down. Sorry, my first time fighting a monster! I could hear heavy footfalls on the carpet as we reached the kitchen. Despite that it looked like a person, it sounded like it was running on all fours. There was definitely some horror movie craziness going on back there. What is that thing? Remember the Ori I mentioned earlier? Oh, great. I shoved Spencer toward the back door, then moved myself closer to the island, using it as a shield between myself and the stairs. What are you- It's after me, not you. If we go together, it'll just chase us both down. You can't- Go get Elliot! He wasn't exactly my choice of savior. <laughs> Damn, poor Elliot. But he said he didn't sleep much. He might be able to help. From next door? Is there another one? Spencer was definitely looking at me like I was insane. Have you not read my journal? He's a vampire. Just go! The Ori hit the bottom of the stairs and skittered on the wood floor, trying to get traction. I snatched the nearest object off the counter to use as a weapon. Probably not a kitchen knife. I somehow don't think a pizza cutter is going to do much against that thing. The Ori paused, opposite from where I was standing. We studied each other from across the island. It looks like Kara. Like an evil, possessed... Kara. My stomach sank. Oh no. 
Spencer, I said get out of here! Kara ignored Spencer, or I thought she, as I thought she would, and advanced toward me. Are we worried that the Ori did manage to possess her? Huh. As she came around the island, I moved around to the other side, trying to keep as much of a barrier between us as possible. She wasn't playing that game. She left on the countertop, and I staggered backwards, foot catching in the legs of the bar stool as I tried to get away. Stumbling toward the hall, I twisted around and swept my arm in front of me. B barrier A weak burst of energy radiated from my fingertips. That feeble attempt never stood a chance against something that had already broken through a barrier set up by a much more adept magic user than I. She jumped at me and went straight through the barrier I'd made like it wasn't even there. Look out! I didn't have a chance to look his way. He smashed into me from the side, knocking me out of the Ori's path. We both fell in a heap near the hall. I scrambled up and staggered away from him back toward the stairs. You never listen! Where was I going to go now? All paths of escape were on the other side of the room, closer to the Ori. It lifted itself to its full height this time, its movements strange and jerking. Like a puppet. I am so dead. <gasps> Corvin! Something soft and light swift by my face, and suddenly there was a crack of thunder that knocked me to the ground and rattled the windows. I heard Spencer cry out, in fear, not pain, and then the familiar chanting. Corvin! My legs turned to jelly as relief flooded me. But... how? He was coming from upstairs? The Ori hissed at the sight of him, and as the light from his magic surrounded it, inky smoke filled the air. It let out a howl of what sounded like pain and barreled out of the kitchen, knocking Spencer aside as it fled down the hall. Spencer! Corvin went after it, but the sound of glass shattering indicated to me that it had probably gone out one of the front windows. I helped Spencer to his feet, relieved when it didn't look like he'd been hurt. Are you okay? Do I look okay? Well, you're not bleeding. Is that the new definition of okay? There was a... A monster in our kitchen! I shrugged helplessly. Corvin suddenly reappeared, running for the back door. Where are you going? It doubled around back to the woods. I need to track it down. I'm coming with you. No, you're not. Yes, I am! I'm not letting you deal with this alone. It's after me anyway. You'll have better luck finding it if I'm with you. He shot me a warning look, then threw the back door open and ran into the yard. Spencer, stay here! Call Allie and tell her what happened, okay? I followed Corvin outside, catching up with him right as he reached the back gate. He whirled around and grabbed me by both shoulders. You're not coming with me! Go back inside! Ooh. Yeah, I can't really help, but... This is an irrefutable truth you cannot deny. No! If I stay here and she comes back, Spencer's just going to be in danger. I'm coming with you. It'll be easier for you to find her that way anyhow. She'll probably come right to us. I'm not using you as bait. Why not? You've already done it before several times. Corvin grimaced and ran a hand through his hair, giving me a pleading look. I should never have gotten you involved. Please just stay here. Don't flatter yourself. I didn't get involved in this because of you. If I'd never met you, Kara's dream still would have come after me, wouldn't it? This is my responsibility. What is? What's your responsibility? Purifying these things at the cost of your own life? No! Really? Then why is that exactly what you're doing? Why? Why are you so willing to sacrifice yourself like this? Because... What is it? I don't want to destroy someone close to you, okay? I don't want to destroy someone I know. What are you talking about? If I... If I can't purify it and return it to her, I have to sever it completely and destroy it. It's just a piece of her. A messed up evil piece that kind of wants to kill people. 
You don't understand what it means to destroy a soul, even a piece. Do you think people recover from having a part of themselves gone forever? Something this big could... severely impact her. I've done it before! And every time I do it... He shook his head. I won't do it. I stared at him as he turned away from me, scrubbing at his face with the back of his hand. I have to return things people don't want to keep. And I have to destroy things they want to hold on to. That's what this job has become. I... I hate it. Sometimes people want to throw away things they need. And sometimes they want to hang on to things they need to let go of. And you think that means it doesn't still hurt people when I do it? I had never seen him look or sound so bitter. I think more people would get hurt if you didn't do it. No one would thank me if they knew this is what I was doing to them. I would. <laughs> you don't understand. You haven't seen what it's like to destroy one yet. But it's getting stronger. At this rate. It's possessed her. I know! I can tell that just by looking. He crouched down, clutching his head as he groaned quietly. I hesitated again, and look what's happened. I don't know if I can even sever it safely anymore. And what happens if you try to purify it like you did before? I... There's no more room. You mean in the White Grimoire? He nodded. I crouched next to him. What happens when it runs out of room, then? The excess miasma. Goes into you. Like some sort of overflow. That's what that black mark is, right? The grimoire takes time to purify Ori. Hours for ones without much blight on them. Days, weeks, months for the ones that are worse. And it's full. How many of these things does he have to keep track of? So use the black one. I don't want to if I can help it. Why not? Because it destroys them. It's more than that. It absorbs them, imprisons them. And over time, they evaporate. They don't just vanish at once. He rubbed at his face. And the host just slowly feels that hole that an Ori leaves grow wider and wider until all that's left is a gaping wound that'll never fully close again. But if it means you can save her, people can survive being wounded. But the way she is now, we can't leave her like that. I know. You can do it. I've only seen something this bad once before. Then let me help you. I don't want you to get hurt. I don't want you to get hurt either. Enough. You don't have to be involved anymore. He started out the back gate, but stopped with his hand on the latch. I know you're mad at me. For... For hiding things. For using you. I won't ask you to forgive me. But... Please... Just stay here, where it's safe for now. I don't want you hurt anymore. His voice was quiet, quavering, and he sounded so... So... Broken. <laughs> After all that, you're gonna smack him or yell at him. Really. Really. That idiot. Huge, stupid, idiot! I wasn't letting him leave like this. I slid my arms around his waist and hugged him tightly. Nora? Do you really think I would be so angry about something like that I couldn't forgive you? I was using you, I- So you're saying that you feel absolutely nothing right now? I- I- 
He let out a long, shaky breath. I... just... I pressed my face against his back and held him tightly. I've been angry about it. I'm not bait. I hate being used as bait. I especially hate that you do it so naturally without saying a word. It hurts. But people can get over being mad, you know. Corvin's shoulders shook slightly as he turned around and wrapped his arms around me. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. I should have explained things sooner. But everything's been happening so fast. Look, we can discuss everything later. And I can berate you for being secretive. Maybe throw you into some walls for old time's sake. Right now... I need to go find Kara. We. You're not going alone. And short of tying me up, there's not much you can do to make me stay here. I... could tie you up. I glared up at him and that stupid little smirk on his face. He pulled away quickly and held both hands up. I'm joking. His face quickly grew serious. You're not going to be able to get through to her, even if you come. I'm not going to try that. Promise me you'll stay behind me and find somewhere safe to hide once I track her down. I won't get in the way, I promise. Then we don't have time to waste. Come on. Corvin pushed open the gate and held it for me. We're going to have to move quickly. We're running out of time. I glanced back at the house where Spencer was standing anxiously by the back door, his phone pressed to his ear. It was well past midnight, and... I didn't have much time left before my situation became critical as well. Tell me about it.